Chapter 25, Problems, Solutions. In those first days of being in the hospital, my mind drifted in and out of a dream world. I had thought I had been shot, but I wasn't sure. Were those dreams or memories? I couldn't remember words either. I wrote to the nurses asking for a wire to clean my teeth. I had a pounding, nonstop headache. I was seeing double. I could hardly hear. I couldn't move my left arm or close my left eye. But for some reason, all I wanted to do was floss my teeth. Your teeth are fine, the doctor said, but your tongue has gone numb. I tried to shake my head. No, I wanted to explain. There was something stuck in my teeth. But shaking my head set off the razor blade pain, so I held still. I couldn't convince them, and they couldn't convince me. Then I saw that my green teddy bear was gone. A white one had taken its place. I felt a special affection for the green teddy bear, since he was by my side that first day. He helped me. I took the notebook and wrote, Where's the green teddy? No one gave me the answer I wanted. They said it was the same teddy that had been by my side the first day. The lights and walls had given him a green glow, but the teddy was white, they said. He was always white. Meanwhile, the bright lights in my room were excruciating, like hot white daggers to my eyes, especially my poor left eye, which wouldn't close. Stop lights, I begged in my notebook. The nurses did their best to darken the room, but as soon as I got some relief from the pain, my thoughts circled back to my father. My father? I wrote again in the notebook. When you can't move, you can't hear, and you can't see properly, your mind spins and spins. And my mind kept going back to the same question. Where was my father? Every time a different doctor or nurse came into my room to change my blanket or check my eyesight, I handed them the notebook and pointed to the questions about my father. They all said not to worry. But I did worry. I couldn't stop. I was also obsessed with how we would pay for all this. Whenever I saw the doctors and nurses talking to each other, I thought for sure that they were saying, Malala doesn't have any money. Malala can't pay for her treatment. There was one doctor who always looked sad, so I wrote him a note. Why are you so sad? I asked. I thought it was because he knew I couldn't pay. But he replied, I'm not sad. Who will pay? I wrote. We don't have any money. Don't worry. Your government will pay, he said. After that, he always smiled when he saw me. Then a new worry seized me. Did my parents know where I was? Maybe they were wandering the streets and alleys of Mingora looking for me. But I am a hopeful person, and therefore when I see problems, I will always think about solutions. So I thought I would go to the hospital's reception desk and ask for a phone so I could call my parents. But then I realized I didn't have the money to pay for such an expensive call. I didn't even know how to dial Pakistan from here. Then I thought, I need to go out and start working to earn money so I can buy a phone and call my family so we can all be together again. Dr. Fiona came into my room and handed me a newspaper clipping. It was a picture of my father standing next to the Pakistan Army's chief of staff. My father was alive, and in the background of the photo was a tall. I smiled. Something bad had happened to me, but I was alive, and now I knew my father was alive. That was a reason to be thankful. Then I noticed a figure in a shawl sitting in the back of the photo near my brother. I could just make out her feet. Those are my mother's feet. That's my mother, I wrote to Dr. Fiona. That night, I slept a bit better. It was a sleep full of strange dreams. Dreams of being on a bed surrounded by lots of people. Dreams of being shot. Dreams of a bomb exploding. 
I would wake up and look around for the green teddy, but it was always just the white one. Now that I knew my family was safe, I spent all my time worrying about how we would pay for my treatment. Obviously, my father was at home because he was selling our few possessions to pay for all this. Our house was rented, the school building was too. Even if he sold everything we owned, it would never be enough. Was he borrowing money? Was he calling on his friends to ask for a loan? Later that day, the man who had spoken to me in Urdu, Dr. Javed Kayani, came in with his cell phone. We are going to call your parents, he said matter-of-factly. I couldn't believe it. You won't cry, he said firmly. You won't weep. You will be strong. We don't want your family to worry. I nodded. I hadn't cried once since I'd arrived. My left eye was constantly weeping, but I had not cried. After a series of blips and beeps, I hear my father's dear and familiar voice. Johnny, he said, how are you feeling, my Johnny? I couldn't reply because of the tube in my throat, and I couldn't smile because my face was numb. But I was smiling inside, and I knew my father knew that. I'll come soon, my father said. Now have a rest, and in two days we will be there. His voice was loud and bright. Maybe a little too bright. Then I realized he had also been told not to cry.